Chapter 32, The Road to Apocalypse. Harbin and his men arrived, footsore but otherwise unharmed, at the edge of Titiana's territory. The Elven Queen had been honorable in her declaration of protection. Harbin felt they had been watched every step of the way, but there were no incidents with the natives. Even the animals seemed to stay clear of them as they trudged the long miles back to the base through the oppressive humidity found beneath the forest canopy. It was clear when they arrived at the border of Her Majesty's territory. The forest ended as suddenly as a cliff. One side of the border was the lush, green, and humid world of Titiana. On the other was the land of Harbin's father and of the Argivians. It had been clear-cut, with every tree sawed down and hauled away. Smooth stumps marked the former forest like gravestones, and every bit of detritus and foliage had been stripped. Off in the distance, a few found themselves... stepped out into the open, and the ground immediately became hard-packed. The sun beat down on it like a hammer. He blinked in the brightness. A few of his men, in turn, stepped into the sunlight. Behind them, from the forest, rose a war cry of elvish voices. As one, the five men bolted across the wreckage of stumps, hoping to make the cover of the burning mound before the elves caught up with them. In his lair of Koilos, Gix watched his entertainment through the eyes of a minion. He was one of the unfortunate among his brotherhood, one of those who had failed the test of the machines. The limbs had been replaced by servos and mechanisms, but the work was shoddy, quickly failed, and could not be replaced. She lay like a broken puppet at the foot of his throne, her useless prosthetics cast in all directions. She had cried about her fate for a long time until Gix tired of that and sewed her lips shut. Still, she had her uses. Gix gripped her skull and tapped into her mind, watching the contest before them through the filter of her emotion and pain. Two of the Su Chis were battling. Gix controlled them as he controlled the woman before him, but did so at a distance. With practice over the long years in this strange land, and with the aid of a few devices of his own creation, he had become very good at commanding the hearts and souls of these machines. The Su Chis stood two paces apart and flailed at each other. One bore a length of chain, the other a club made of the leg of another Suchi it had previously beaten in battle. Gix commanded the two automatons to beat each other to pieces, and, loyal to their god, they did so without complaint or comment. There was no poetry to this battle, for both machines stood their ground, neither retreating nor dodging. Instead, they relentlessly hammered away at each other, and the cavern walls echoed with the clang of metal on metal. As they thundered at each other, Gick's observer watched, flinching with each rasping clash of metal. Occasionally, a part of one of the Suchis would fly off. She would start suddenly, her skull firmly in the grip of the demon. Gix savored the feeling, the sudden rush of adrenaline through the priest's body. Without her senses or reactions, the battle was merely a study of forces and impacts of metal and resistance. But through human eyes, the two inhuman machines took on different appearances, and Gix relished the difference. The combatants were tireless, but in the end, the metal itself succumbed before the mindless will of the participants. The chain-wielding automaton wrapped the length of the chain around its opponent's neck and snapped off its head from its pivots. The head of the blue metal wires bounced off its support toward the throne, and Gick's observer flinched at that as well. Meanwhile, the now-blind automaton attempted to hammer its opponent with its club. Its opponent let go of the chain and blocked the attack with an upraised arm, which bent under the force of the blow. Sparks began to issue from the joints of the former chain welder from the impact, yet it moved smoothly under the blow and reached up with both hands, driving its fingers into the clubber's chest. The former chain wielder pulled its hands apart and ripped its opponent's chest open. There was a shower of sparks as the leg wielder collapsed in on itself, lacking anything at its center to hold it together. Again, the observer flinched and tried to turn away, but Gix held her head tightly and commanded her to keep her eyes open to drink in the eye-searing sparks of the device's destruction. In an instant, it was over. The chain wielder towered over the broken pile of scrap metal that had been its opponent. Gix felt the fear and revulsion in his observer and drank it in like a fine wine. He let go of her, withdrawing the talons back into himself as she collapsed into a twitching pile at the foot of the throne. Gix rose and strode to the victorious automaton. Sparks rained from its joints, and the battering it had received had caved in part of its skull. 
Gix held out a finger and pushed against the victor's chest. The Su Chi unbalanced, tilted backward, and smashed against the hard stone floor of the cabin. Its arms and legs separated under the blow, and its chest heaved in one last shower of sparks. Then it was quiet. Unworthy, he said as an epitaph. Gix looked at the two fallen devices, so very much like the brothers they were, mindless, easily manipulated, and relentless in their assault. And in the end, the victor would be vulnerable to Gix. Soon, said the demon through lipless teeth. Very soon. Queen Tatiana was dying, thought Gwenna. The queen was dying, and the land was dying with her. A continual haze pervaded the surviving forest now as more and more of the land fell to assaults of the brothers. From one side, Urza advanced. From the other, Mishra, and they left nothing in their wake. With each glade that fell, with each knot of trees that was lumbered and consumed by their machines, with each mountain that was strip-mined, the land grew weaker. With the land, the queen grew weaker, and with the queen, the people. Gwenna could feel it, so could the others. Their tie to the land, the soft and reassuring touch that they felt in the core of their being, was gone. It was only emptiness, emptiness and the smoke of the burning pyres. Titiana had retreated to the most hidden part of her kingdom to plan the last assault, Gwenna had been told, but she had not seen the queen before her retreat and knew that Titiana would not emerge from her sanctuary again. Her majesty was hardened, haggard, and exhausted, for each blow against the land was a blow against her. Gwenna knew that Titiana was lost to them, and with that, the wisdom of Gaia herself and the goddess's protection. Gwenna would not stand aside and wait for news to come of Titiana's surrender, nor for a final battle after their forces were so weakened they'd be ineffective. They could stand against one of the invaders, but not both at once. She spoke with others among the elves and decided they must make their own assault. Then the red-haired woman appeared in the group of plotters and gave them the opportunity to strike back. Now she and a legion of comrades had gathered on the denuded shores of Argoth, an area where the despoiling armies had passed but not remained. They waited on the shores for one set of enemies in order to strike out against the others. The others rounded the headlands in their strange ships of metal and wood, their internal engines shooting sparks into the night sky. Some of the elves muttered among themselves, and Gwenna heard the word abominations. But she would ride in the belly of these abominations if it meant she could fight the invaders on their home ground. The larger ships remained in the deep waters of the bay while smaller craft came and beached on the shores. The red-haired woman with the ornate staff led the way, followed by a group of warriors swathed in cloth. These later warriors were led by an old human with a narrow face. The red-haired woman bowed curtly and said in Gwenna's tongue, Are you prepared for the voyage? Gwenna looked at her people. There was nervousness among them, but also anger. Anger at having their homes destroyed and their lands ripped asunder by the invaders. She nodded. Then you best board, and board quickly. As long as you're on shore, you're vulnerable, said the red-haired woman. Fortunately, the storms offshore have abated, so it should be safe sailing. The storms were abating because Titiana was dying, thought Gwenna, but she said nothing. Instead, she merely nodded and gave the signal to her forces. They hefted their weapons and began climbing into the boats. Gwenna paused for a moment and listened as the red-haired woman and the old man made their goodbyes. Gwenna did not understand what they were saying and wondered for a moment if the two had been lovers and were now parting, possibly forever. The thought appealed to Gwenna as she climbed over the gunwales of the boat and took her first steps away from Argoth and into the heart of enemy land. This is risky, said Hajar, as the elves in their armor and shellacked wood clambered into the boats. Everything's risky, said Ashnod, but we need to strike at Urza's boatyards before he can resupply further. We don't have the manpower, but these forest children are mad enough at him to do the job for us. You should come along, said Hajar. Ashnod shook her head. Mishra will accept your departure, I think, but if I leave, he'll come after me. He'll be angry, said the old Falaji. He'll be delighted, said Ashnod, when you succeed. I'll bring the boats back, said Hajar. Ashnod shook her head again. Why, so they may be used to bring supplies from Zegon? There's nothing left there. It's all been melted down and chopped down and converted and sent here. We're at the end of things, Hajar. It's now or never. Hajar was silent for a moment, then he said stiffly, I have not missed your way of thinking. The Brotherhood of Gix is not nearly as comforting. Ashnod said, I will tell Mishra when he finds out that this was my idea, but that you insisted on leading the raid so things would work out. Hajar chewed over the idea, then managed a small smile. It has been an honor working with you. You think like a man, he said. Ashnod's fingers tightened around her staff, but she said, 
Thank you, Hajar. I accept that as a compliment you mean it to be. The boats were loaded, and Hajar was gone, rowing out to the larger craft. Ashdod watched the sparkling lights of the craft until they sailed again around the headland and were lost. Then she began a long walk back to camp, wondering if Mishra would even notice that Hajar and the ships were gone. He's sending me home? snarled Harbin, settling down in the camp chair across the tent from Tanos. Tanos looked up from his work but said nothing. He says I'm needed more back in Penragon, continued the younger man. Tanos tightened a nut on a large construct he was working on and said, He's right. Of course he's right, snapped Harbin. He's always right. That's what being Lord Protector's all about, isn't it? Being right. Tanos stood up and regarded his handiwork. This looks about ready. What do you think? Harbin looked at the object. It looked like a large crate, seven feet in length and three in height and depth. It was unremarkable, save that it was made of metal and had a great heavy lid. Looks like a coffin, said the younger man. Tonnels took a step back, looked at the construct, and smiled. Yes, I suppose it does. All the better, I guess. What does this one do? said Harbin, putting his irritation with his father aside. When I was Mishra's guest, they kept me in a cell, forgotten by the rest of the world, said Tonnels. As he spoke, he flexed his right hand as if to shake out an ancient pain. I'd been thinking about it and came up with this. It functions with some of the same mechanisms that power the old amulets of Krug, along with Ashnod's staff from Zegon. Uh-huh, said Harbin. And what does it do? It will keep a body within a stasis, effectively asleep for as long as the power stones operate within it or until the box is opened. Tunnels looked at Harbin. You see, I've been thinking about what your father will do with his brother once he defeats him. I don't think he could bring himself to kill him, but... Neither could he suffer him to live. This, Tonos patted the top of the lid, is the third option. Harbin smiled, and it was a warm smile. Uncle Tonos, you're now inventing answers to questions no one has even posed yet. You assume you're going to defeat Mishra and take him alive if we do. Of course we're going to win, said Tonos. We did not come this far to give up. I wonder, said Harbin. Tonos blinked at the younger man. You have doubts? Harbin shook his head. Not I, but in talking with father, he shook his head again. He seems, well, not despondent, but weary, tired, resigned, said Tanos. His has been a long road, and it will finally end soon. I think he knows it. It will end, one way or the other. And when it does end, said Harbin, I want to be here, one way or the other. Tanos shook his head. The elves have gotten their hands on boats and are marauding their way up the coast. We need a good leader to rally the garrison units against him. You are that leader. Harbin said nothing. You wanted an opportunity to lead, said Tanos. And the price of leadership is that you have to keep leading, even if you'd rather be somewhere else. Harbin slowly nodded. You and father already talked about this, correct? Tanos shrugged. He sought my advice regarding your well-being. Harbin looked up at the older, taller man and said, Will you look after him? Father, I mean, after his well-being. I always do, the master scholar replied. No, said the younger man. I mean this. When we parted, he said something that's bothered me. He said, Tell your mother to remember it as I tried to be, not as I was. He doesn't think he's going to live through this. Harbin looked at the ground and Tano said, I'll look after him. I've been doing it for years, in one way or the other. Harbin sighed. I told him I was wrong, too. Wrong about wanting to stay at his side? Asked Tanos. Harbin shook his head. A long time ago, he asked me what I thought about the Union's work, about magic. I, I told him I doubted it that even existed, but now, after seeing the elves and their queen and what they can do without any devices at all, I'm unsure. I, I feel responsible for convincing him that magic did not exist. I don't think anyone ever convinced Urza of anything he did not believe himself, said Tanos. Just remember that there's always something you don't know that you can afford to learn. Is that why you're still with father after all these years? asked Harbin. Probably, said Tanos. But I have learned much from a lot of people. I guess I assumed that I never knew it all to start with and was more willing to listen to others. Harbin smiled at Tonos' words. The older man went out to the far side of the tent and rummaged around, finally pulling out a short wand. 
The device was about the length of Harbin's forearm and had a thick, bulbous tip like an orange. Here, he said, a going-away present. Harbin looked at the device. What is it? Another machine I developed some time back. It masks the user from the sensory devices of the artifact creatures. This was a prototype. It doesn't seem to work on the larger beings, but it'll help if there are any of those transmigrants around. Harbin smiled. Still trying to protect me, Uncle Tanos? No. You keep the wand. You'll probably need it more than I do. Where am I going? So you will be going, said Tanos. Harbin held out his hands in mock surrender. Of course, the younger man gave a smile. But once these elven marauders are taken care of, I'll be back. Count on that. Of that I have no doubt, said Tanos. After all, you are your father's son. Of course I am, said Harbin, a tired smile spreading across his face. Who else would I be? Mishra did not question Hajar's absence, nor ask about the missing ships, nor even Ashnod herself. Instead, he pushed deeper and deeper into the heartland of the island. Anything that could not be fed immediately into the foundries was killed and burned, and the charnel pits dotted the countryside. The air hung heavy with the smoke of what once had been Argoth's forests. Mishra's forces moved with the smooth and relentless efficiency of a machine, mowing down everything in their path. Finally, Ashnod was summoned once more into Mishra's presence. A priest of Gix hung over his shoulder as she entered, like vultures waiting for the lion to make a fresh kill. You have been talking to natives of this island, said Mishra without waiting for her to bow and scrape. Ashnod looked at the leering priests, then said, Of course, I have been endeavoring them to get them to attack Urza's forces as opposed to our own. They have company of druidical priests that Mishra interrupted as if she had said nothing after, of course. Do you believe that they could defeat my brother's forces? Ashnod looked at Mishra, but his brows were in shadow, and she could not see his eyes. No, she said simply. I don't think they could. But they could weaken him, said Mishra. Yes, said Ashnod. What is this about? Mishra's head snapped up, and Ashnod saw fire in the man's eyes. Urza's main position is seven days away. There is a force of elves heading toward it, which is two days away from arriving. If the elves reach my brother first, they may weaken him sufficiently, allowing me to crush him completely. Your thoughts? Urza has many machines on his side, began Ashnod, but stopped as Mishra's scowl grew deeper. Y yes, if the elves attack Urza first, then he'll be weakened, but he would win any direct battle with the natives. Thank you, said Mishra, turning away. You may go. My lord, said Ashnod, if there's to be a battle, we need to draw up a plan of assault. One has already been drawn up, said Mishra, and the priest gave another leering smile. Ashnod knew who had done the advising in this matter. We will gather our forces and move in behind the elves, ready to attack after they do. You may go. Ashnod looked at the priest, then bowed low to Mishra and left his headquarters, muttering as she did so. That evening there was a celebration among the Brotherhood of Gix. There was a bonfire in their camp and much chanting and singing. Ashnod considered trying to reach Mishra then, but decided against it. The Gixians had probably left at least one of their number behind to watch over the artifice Kadir. The red-haired woman sat on her bunk, holding the old pack that still contained the Golgothian Silex. She was to have no role in the battle, it seemed and no role in whatever would follow it. She thought for a moment and looked into the darkness, the only sound the cheers of priests of Gix. Ashnod would have a role, whether Mishra wanted it or not. She pulled some parchment from her pack and a stylus and began composing a letter to an old friend. The elves never stood a chance, thought Tanos, sadly. All the valor and bravery and devotion in the world did not matter when you were armed with wooden armor and bone weapons, facing remorseless metal and unthinking stone. They came in waves, elves, sprites, centaurs, and tree folk. Some were riding great wildcats, and others were commanding herds of slugs that wrapped around the legs of an artifact and sucked its energy dry. The sky above rumbled and lanced down bolts of electrical fury, and the ground replied in the thunder of feet moving across the hard-backed surface of the ravaged earth. And towering above it all was a titanic figure, a living embodiment of the torn forests of Argoth. It was huge and roughly humanoid, but the mane of its hair was trees, and its body was made of the living wood, entwined in upon itself to form massive muscles, 
It bore a stone sword that seemed to be forged from the heart of the mountain itself. Tonnels remembered what Harbin had said about the elven magics and knew that the elves had somehow animated the power of the forest and bent it to their will. Urza's forces were quickly arrayed in defense. Avengers, Sentinels, Tetravi, and Triskelions, insect-headed mechanical soldiers armed with weapons of new steel and statues crafted out of the primal clay. Word was sent down the line for reinforcements as the first wave struck the Argivian lines. The elves were slaughtered. For every mechanical device that fell, 30 elves perished. For every ornithopter that was brought down, that was 50 pixies. The tree folk screamed as they went up in flames, one after another, and still the elves came on. Taunos was at the center of the line and felt it begin to waver, then to give under the relentless assault. Taunos called for more support, but the auxiliary units were already committed to the flanks. If the center did not hold, then the army would collapse in on itself. The sky rumbled again. The ground responded with a deeper cry, and Tonos knew the reinforcements had arrived. Urza had his own titan, crafted in the mountains of Sardia before the dwarves betrayed them. It was a hulking giant of stone and metal that towered over everything in its path. A single stride was a hundred feet, and crows and carrion birds had nested in on its head. Urza had brought it to Argoth on a great barge, and it acted as a lighthouse to guide the ships to safe harbor past the storms. Now it met the only other being on the island that was its equal. The tree monster bellowed a challenge, and while the Colossus was silent, it turned and bore down on its opponent. The two locked in combat that dwarfed the lesser beings around them. The center of both lines broke to give the Titans room to brawl, and those elves and devices that were too slow to get out of the way were smashed into the earth. The stone sword arced through the air and bit deeply into the Colossus' side, the great animate statue shuddered, and plates of metal cascaded from its joints like scales shed from a snake. The forest titan reared back for another assault, but the colossus was too fast for it. It grabbed the attacker's arm, and it descended it smoothly and effortlessly twisted it from its socket. There was a sound of an entire jungle screaming as the forest beast's arm was ripped loose and sent spinning across the shallow valley. The forest titan was not to be denied, for as it had lost one arm, it swung heavily with the other, a massive hand made of wood and rock. This smashed against the side of the Colossus' head, and most of the giant's face became a cloud of dust. The Colossus did not need its head to think or react. It grappled the front of the forest titan with one hand. With the other, it reared back and slammed a fist into the creature's chest like a battering ram assaulting an enemy gate. The forest thing's body exploded in a rain of splinters that cut down troops within a hundred yards of the brawl. Its legs thundered to the ground in two separate directions, and its head rolled backward and plummeted, screaming as it fell. That broke the elves' morale completely. Their assault fell apart with their gigantic leader, and they fled from the battle, dropping their weapons as they ran. Those machines that could pursue did so, cutting down the forest dwellers with neither remorse nor pity. Yet the forest titan had succeeded, for the colossus could not recover from its attack. The force of the blow ripped the stone statue's own arm from its moorings, and it cascaded to the ground with the sound of an avalanche. Bolts of lightning shot from its metal-plated joints, and the great statue slowly dropped to its knees, then sprawled forward, face down, across the small stream that now ran red with blood and black with oil. The valley shook as it was struck down. Tonos watched the rout and felt sadness. It was not the elves' fault that they were forced to fight for a land they could not hold. They were merely in the wrong place at the wrong time. Had their land remained secret, they would have been spared all of this. But once revealed... They were cast in a maelstrom of war with the rest of them. He shook his head as the last group of elves and centaurs tried to rally on a mound of fallen triskelions, only to be overrun by soldiers. All that was left after that was the cleanup. The bodies were collected and burned. The artifacts were checked and repaired. The Colossus was beyond help, but plates from its hide could be stripped and used for other creatures. Urza arrived in the evening with additional reinforcements, along with more artificers and mechanics to help with the repairs. Though the elven force was almost entirely wiped out, it had taken a heavy toll on the Argivians. Then the scout arrived with the bad news. Mishra's force had been spotted five days' march to the west and was making for their position. Tonos argued they should pull back, at least to the safety of the coastal forts, but Urza would hear nothing of it. Strip the forts within four days. March of here, he said. We will fight here. We are battered and tired, noted Tanos. Our machines are battered, but they cannot be tired, said Urza. What non-combatant living beings we have, we can evacuate in time. Let this battle be at a time and place of our choosing. Tanos looked at Urza and saw that Harbin had been right. 
Urza seemed resigned to battling his brother, regardless of the outcome. It would all end here, one way or another. The scout also brought a message for Tanos. He did not say where he had got it, but Tanos knew who it was from the moment he saw the handwriting. Something important? Urza asked. Has Harbin had success against the Raiders? Message from an old friend, Tano said, scowling. Urza was already poring over the maps of the surrounding terrain and only nodded. Tano's pocketed the message, and Urza said nothing more on the matter. Tano's thought of the date. If they take five days to get here and attacked by the sixth, it'll be the last day of the year. Perhaps we can begin the new year with the world at peace when we win. The last day, said Urza softly, and on the last day, we're equal. Pardon? said Tanos. Urza shook his head. Just an old thought. You get to advanced age and that's all you have anymore. Old thoughts and regrets. In Koilos, the demon Gix heard the chants of his priests. In Argoth, and he knew it was time to go to them. All the pieces were in place. The one brother was wounded and his sibling was bearing down on him. The survivor would be battered beyond belief and in no shape to defend himself. Neither was prepared for the surprise the demon had prepared for them. Gix smiled as a small point of light appeared near his throne. It grew until it had formed into a disc, like a reflecting pool that had been turned on its side. There was the smell of smoke and a distant sound of crashing gears. He looked around at his domain within the cavern and the scattered parts of the demolished Su Chi. He would soon return in triumph. He looked at his observer, the poor priestess whose mechanical limbs had rejected her. She implored him with her eyes, for she no longer could speak. The disc was almost fully formed, Gix did not have much time. He walked over to her and cradled her head in his hands. His talons pierced the flesh of her scalp and drove through the bone into the brain itself. Gix opened every synapse in the woman's mind and let the holy fire fill her as every part of her brain fried at once. She jerked and spasmed in his hands and then was still. He let go of her and she slumped to the floor, a puppet with its strings cut. Gix noticed that there was a smile on her sewn together lips and he smiled in return as he stepped through the gate and into the final battle between the brothers.